Hey guys, Angus here, got another Airsoft gun review for you guys today. Today we're going to be taking a look at a fairly new release to the Airsoft market. It's part of Echo One's all new Troy licensed line. This is the Echo One MRF-C M4 RAS Airsoft AEG. Now if you're interested in purchasing the product after you watch this review, there'll be a link down below in the description to airsplat.com where you can buy the gun for about $195. Now with that being said, some of you are probably wondering why I would review an Echo One gun. Why do you know that I had a bias towards Echo One coming into this review? Well, did it change after I saw this product? Well, let's get into the review. Let's start off. An Echo One USA warranty card, being that this gun is covered under Echo One's warranty. A butterfly winding key, front sight post adjustment tool, bright orange muzzle cap. Then there is a very nice rubber coated vertical foregrip. A 9.6 volt, 1500 milliamp small type nunchuck battery. A small type trickle charger. One metal, 300 round high capacity M4 magazine. A rather short de-jamming rod. And of course, your Echo One MRF-C itself. Now sitting in the box, the gun looks rather nice. You're probably not gonna be able to wait to take this thing out, hold it in your hands. And out of the box, the gun certainly has a solid feel to it. it weighs in around six to eight pounds, so it has a significant amount of heft, but it's not too heavy. It's actually more so of a lightweight gun. A lot of that lightweight is due to the fact the gun is composed of quite a bit of polymer. Your upper and lower receiver, basically the body of your gun, is composed of polymer. Now some of you might be freaking out at that fact, but it's really not that big of a deal. The upper and lower receiver, they're fairly durable, and also that polymer body does keep the weight of the gun down a bit. Not to say there isn't quite a bit of metal on the AEG, being the top rail, your full RAS system, your outer barrel, iron sights, included metal magazine, and buffer tube for your crane stock are composed of metal. So you definitely get a good mix of metal on here as opposed to the polymer components, which would be your receiver, as already stated, your included vertical foregrip, your gun's pistol grip, and the actual crane stock itself. So a good mix, and like I said, it keeps the weight down. Internally, the gun is built rather solidly, a standard version two metal gearbox with steel gears. One thing that certainly stands out internally on this gun would be its stock motor, which is pretty nice. So on the Chrono, we saw it ranging out around 900 rounds per minute on the included 9.6 volt battery. So that motor definitely does stand out to me. Otherwise, your internals, they're about the same level as CYMA or JG internals. So pretty good internals for the price you pay. Externally, solid gun despite a bit of plastic, and internally, pretty good internals. Being that this gun is one of Echo One's all new Troy license line, naturally it's gonna have some trademarks from Troy on it. The largest of which is this one located on the left side of the gun's lower receiver. Other trademarks on this AEG include this one located just above the gun's trigger and trigger guard, this one located on the gun's RAS system, and finally, these trademarks, located on both of the iron sights. The trades on this gun are painted on rather nicely in bright white paint. I don't think they're gonna fade off anytime soon. Let's move on to some of the features of the Echo One MRF-C. The first feature I'd especially like to focus on would be the Echo One MRF-C's crane stock. This is your standard six position crane stock that is adjusted via that small push-in piece on the bottom. Shown here, the crane stock is in its shortest position, which actually, when you have the vertical grip attached to the Echo One gun, it is actually pretty comfortable to shoot like this. However, if you wanted to extend it, you simply push in that button and the stock will extend to any of its other six positions, such as its longest position shown here. Now the crane stock itself is actually made fairly well. The push piece on the bottom, however, is attached pretty loosely. The crane stock is adjustable, allows you to get a little bit more comfort with your gun when you're shooting it. However, it does have another purpose. The crane stock houses your AEG's battery. In order to access your battery compartment, you need to pop off the rubber coated butt plate on the back of the gun. Now the butt plate does have some nice rubber serration on there, helps grip into your shoulder a little bit better and is certainly comfortable to shoulder this rifle. When you've got the butt plate popped off, you want to set it aside. However, there is something I need to point out. In order to attach the butt plate, you need to make sure these two prongs are lined up. You're probably saying two prongs, I only see one. That's a con about this gun. 
I went to put the butt plate on, and one of the cheaply made prongs simply snapped off. So now the butt plate doesn't exactly attach very well, and the only way for me to securely attach it is to tape it. Just something to watch out for. I'm not sure if it was just mine, however, I imagine it will happen on the others. Just watch that prong doesn't snap off. Be careful when putting this thing on. Once you set the butt pad aside, you will reveal your gun's battery compartment, which is designed with two narrow tubes on its side in order to house nunchuck-style batteries. Although this crane stock is spacious enough to house a larger 9.6 volt nunchuck, it can only take nunchuck batteries. So although it can take the larger batteries, it is limited in the sense that there is only one type of battery you can use. So sort of a pro-con there. One thing I do want to point out about the battery on this gun, I actually had the prong slip out of the Tamiya connector a little bit earlier. So just something to watch out for. Once you have your battery installed, you can simply reinsert that butt plate. Another thing I found out with the crane stock is concerning those two sort of screws right there. They're not really screws, they're more so just kind of pieces of plastic wedged into the end of the crane stock so that way your battery doesn't slip out the front. They're not attached to anything, they're just wedged in. And if you do push the battery in too hard, those things pop out. I don't like that very much. I think Echo wants you to take in a little bit of time, maybe just glue them in there or something. Because I went to put my battery in, they shot out, and my battery slid out the front of the stock. So when you get this gun, if that does occur, I would really recommend you just glue them in place so that doesn't happen. Honestly, this crane stock is full of cons. However, luckily, a lot of the cons stop at the crane stock. Your fire selector switch on this gun, for example, is completely free of problems. It's your standard M4 fire selector switch. It is not ambidextrous, being located only on the gun's left lower receiver, and has your standard three settings. Facing forward, the gun is unsafe. The trigger cannot be pulled. Flipped upward, the gun is on semi-automatic. One BB will be fired each time the trigger is squeezed. And when facing all the way backward, the fire selector switch is on full auto, which I mentioned, the gun certainly has a nice rate of fire on that setting. The selector switch is crisp, easy to move, and does not get stuck in between settings. Staying in roughly the same region, let's go ahead and talk about your gun's included magazine and also its magazine well. In order to eject the mag, simply give the gun's magazine release, located on the gun's right side just above the trigger guard, a push. Now when the mag release is pushed, the magazine simply slides out. The included magazine is a standard metal, 300 round, high capacity M4 magazine. One of the pros of this gun is the fact that it accepts basically all your M4 mags, so if you're on the field, chances are somebody's going to have a spare mag if you run out. The mag works like a standard high cap, being wound with a large gear at the bottom, fed through the top, and also the reservoir is filled through the top as well. Didn't have any feeding issues with the mag, however I did have to wind it quite a bit, so you may want to bring out that included butterfly key and use that so you don't have to continue winding the gear at the bottom. When you go to put the mag in, make sure your BB port is facing towards the front of the gun and simply slide it in like so. The mag gives you a nice clack letting you know it is inserted and locked into place. There's really no wobble at all when the magazine is inside the gun. The MRF-C does of course feature iron sights and they are flip down, as you can see currently in the flip down position. When you want to raise them up, simply give the large button on the sides a push and they will raise into their upright positions as they are now. As you can also see, as I pointed out earlier, those bright white trademarks certainly do stand out on the sights. The rear sight is adjustable. It has two apertures, a pinhole aperture and an open hole aperture. Your front sight is just a standard sort of half target sight with a sight post in the middle you can adjust via the included adjustment tool. If you don't want to use these iron sights, simply flip them down, make use of that very long top rail which you can go ahead, mount really any optic you want up there, whether it's a full length rifle scope or a standard close quarter battle MRS style red dot sight. Speaking of rails, this would be a fine time to talk about the gun's full metal RAS system located of course on its front handguard. Now the gun is covered in rails, you have your two side rails, that long top rail already mentioned, of course the bottom rail currently taken up by the gun's included vertical foregrip. I love it when guns have RAS systems like this because you can basically custom out any way you want. Got the side rails for laser, flashlight, bottom rail for the included vertical grip, maybe a grenade launcher if you want to use this in CQB, and of course the top rail for an optic. So the RAS on this gun really can fit quite a bit of stuff on there, and it's certainly a nice thing to have that customization option on your gun. The gun's charging handle is functional, and when pulled back, flips down your dust cover and reveals your gun's hop-up unit. 
I found the hop-up unit on this gun to actually be pretty nice. Minimal feeding issues, and it really did help the range of the gun. In fact, with the hop-up off, shooting with .25s, I was accurately hitting targets around 100 feet. You can only imagine what this hop-up must do when it is adjusted. Definitely adds some range. I'd say the maximum range with your hop-up adjusted, it's around 150 feet I was hitting targets accurately with .25 gram BBs. The gear is rather easy to adjust, and when you have adjusted it, simply release the charging handle, and your hop-up is covered up. All right, so we've covered basically all of the features of the Echo One MRF-C. So let's go ahead and get into the final conclusion. Now, as I stated at the beginning of the video, I don't really care for Echo One too much, and frankly, I still don't like them too much as a company. But when talking directly about the product, I have to say it's a pretty nice gun. Construction-wise, yes, you do get a lower and upper receiver composed of polymer as opposed to metal. Not necessarily a bad thing, being that it does keep the weight down, and frankly, the polymer is durable in its own right. However, I think they probably could have still made the gun metal for basically the same exact price. The Troy trademarks externally are certainly a nice touch. Uh, don't really matter too much for performance-wise, but they do look rather nice on the AEG. Internally, two pieces that very much stood out to me was the gun's hop-up unit and stock motor. I wasn't expecting the gun to be so accurate and have such a nice rate of fire straight out of the box. Features-wise, the biggest problem on the gun is the crane stock. Yes, it's nice to have that on there because, frankly, it holds your battery, and also you can adjust it for your comfort when you're holding the replica. However, it's basically a pretty cheap piece. The butt pad, the prong broke, the wedges slipped out of the stock, causing the battery to lunge forward and therefore pull the time of connector off of the prongs of the battery itself. So just be careful with that. Maybe you want to reinforce the stock a little bit when you first get the gun, but uh, otherwise, it's the stock that holds the battery. It has to be on the gun. Battery space-wise, it's limited, as it can only take nunchuck batteries, but it can hold rather large nunchuck batteries. Other features on the gun that are certainly rather nice are the iron sights. I actually like these iron sights quite a bit, not only due to the fact that they have the nice trades on them, but also they're pretty nice, solidly built iron sights in their own right. Also, the gun's various rails, its whole RES system up front, is great for customization options. You can go ahead and customize this gun, make it unique, despite the fact that it is an M4. Also, speaking of M4s, the compatibility with M4 mags is a awesome pro. In today's world, somebody's bound to be on that field using an M4, so chances are, if you run into mags, you can just borrow one from a buddy. Overall, I'd have to say this gun is pretty good, probably an 8 out of a 10 for me. It's something that could find a home in CQB, being that's more so what it's designed for, and also out here in the Woodland-style games as well. So if you're looking for a gun, definitely beginner intermediate players, look towards the Echo One MRF-C, available at airsplat.com for about $195. Thanks for watching, guys. Please subscribe.